Hey everybody, welcome to the second edition of the A-Pod. I'm Ardo Cal. Thank you very much for checking out my podcast. Fun chats, fun topics with fun people. It's been a blast. I am really enjoying the fact that this podcast is out and I'm enjoying doing it. The first podcast uh, got some great reviews and I want to thank everybody who checked out the first podcast and, and gave it a chance I know that there are a lot of podcast options out there, and so for you to go out of your way to check out this one, I really appreciate it, and I hope that you stick with it because we're going to be having some great guests in the future, and it's going to be a blast, and thank you to MSG Networks for hosting this podcast as well, and it drops every single Wednesday. You can find it on msgnetworks.com or on iTunes. Uh, we'll get to the guest a little bit later on, and I have a couple of interesting and fun stories I want to share with you as well. Uh, but the first thing I want to do, and not to bring this to a downer tone, but I definitely want to mention this because uh, this person was very instrumental in my development uh, early on. Uh, when I was focused on the world of professional wrestling, uh, one of my younger de- man dreams uh, was to be an announcer with WWE, and I was able to make it there. Uh, that'll be a story for another time. But one of the people who was really instrumental in mentoring me and guiding me along and even going to bat for me in that company while he was still there uh, was Jim Ross, uh, known to many as good old JR, the voice of a generation. Uh, with all due respect to greats like Gordon Soley and others, the greatest professional wrestling announcer of all time. And he, unfortunately, his wife, Jan, uh, suffered an accident uh, on her Vespa scooter uh, and she lost her life. And so I just wanted to send my thoughts and prayers and condolences to Jim and his friends and family Uh, My thoughts and prayers are with them at this time, this very difficult time. And just to show you the type of man that JR is, uh, even in what you could absolutely consider his darkest hour, losing the love of his life, his angel, as he said on social media, called Jan his angel, uh, he is still going to fulfill all of his obligations uh, during a very busy week. Uh, WrestleMania is coming up in Orlando and he had a lot of bookings a lot of appearances to make and you know you could say a part of that is is just so that he can uh, keep occupied and people will love to see him and there will be an uh, a swell of support and love shown to him and that's perhaps definitely uh, what JR might need right now so um, if you are attending those events uh, definitely you know, send those good vibes and positive thoughts his way and enjoy that. And to JR, uh, my thoughts and prayers are with you and your friends and family. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you very much for everything that you've done for me in my career, because you really didn't have to and you still did. And I know that there are many other people that think the exact same way. So uh, I just wanted to make sure I mentioned that before we moved on here on the podcast. So right now, uh, you might laugh at me, but I'm sitting in a closet right now. Um, Basically, uh, my girlfriend is in the living room watching TV. I think she's watching Girls or Veep, one of the two. And so to get away from the noise, I'm sitting in a closet and I'm surrounded by uh, a mixture of her clothes and mine. There's a vacuum cleaner in here. There's a Swiss ball, which I'm pretty sure hasn't been used in years. There's a bunch of empty luggage that's just up on the shelves. There's a whole bunch of tax documents, which are fresh, by the way, because we are in the thick of tax season. There's also a, actually, there's two uh, retro New Jersey Devils uh, retro night posters. And if you're a Devils fan listening to this, you know full well that the uh, New Jersey Devils uh, release game posters that are usually themed. And uh, back in January, they had Retro Night, which was phenomenal. The intro video, the poster, which was inspired by NHL 94, uh, one of the best theme nights I've ever seen at any sporting event, let alone hockey. 
uh, the events team with the Devils. I work with them. I'll get to that. This past weekend, I was actually with them on Saturday and Sunday. They're an excellent team top to bottom. A lot of great talent there, and they all work very, very hard. So NH, speaking of NHL 94, I do want to mention very quickly that Ice Madness is still going on. If you read my blog, that's on msgnetworks.com. It drops every Monday throughout the month of March. Inspired by March Madness, we are aiming to vote. All of us, you, me, everybody, will vote to determine the greatest retro ice hockey video game of all time. As you listen to this, the semifinals will be voted on and the finals will be determined before the end of March. Check it out. Uh, It's called Arda's Words on the Blog. That's my blog at msgnetworks.com. Ice Madness will conclude uh, this week. If you're listening to this uh, the day it comes out, uh, Ice Madness will conclude on March 30th. And so we will have determined the greatest hockey retro video game of all time. If you're asking for my opinion, I'm recording this before I know what the semifinals are. So I'm going to say Blades of Steel is going to be my pick. I'm pretty confident in that. But I know a lot of people online have been picking NHL 94. And I wouldn't doubt that NHL 94 wins. But I just feel like Blades of Steel edges out NHL 94. But we'll see. NHL 95 might still be in the running. Ice hockey for NES might still be in the running. I can't believe Mutant League Hockey got eliminated in the first round. You know who else said the same thing was Ryan Panagos, who uh, is known as Agent M over at Marvel. Him and uh, my good buddy Ryan and and also Ben Morse, both of them work at Marvel. And I was on their podcast uh, this past week, which was a lot of fun. And we talked about a future blog that I'm going to try and put together, hockey references among Marvel characters. And I have to say, it's pretty difficult. There aren't many out there. We keep searching. Yeah, it's uh, not pretty prevalent. I I was joking that I might just assume that all of Alpha Flight and Wolverine were hockey fans because they're Canadian. But I think I have to do a little bit more digging. But shout out to Agent M and Ben Morse, my good buddies at Marvel. Thank you for having me on your podcast. And there are some pictures that I tweeted online from their offices which is awesome. They have this wall that most people, celebrities that go there, take pictures against the wall because it's a fantastic mural, basically, of Marvel characters. Spider-Man, Iron Man, Thor, you name it, they're there. And it's awesome. So kudos to them. And that article will come out soon. What should we get to next? Uh, Well, we talked about the Devils. So this past weekend, I was the in-arena host for the New Jersey Devils, which means that I hosted the contests and I told you what the raffle draws were all about and that kind of fun stuff. It was a blast, especially because the NHL 100 Centennial Fan Arena was outside. It was New Jersey's turn to have all the festivities. So there is a museum on wheels that parks outside, that parked outside a Prudential Center and There's all this old memorabilia there. If you've never been to the Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto, it's definitely worth the pilgrimage if you're a hockey fan. You have to go. It's wonderful what's in there. The Stanley Cup is there, and you can take a picture with it. But the Stanley Cup was also in New Jersey this weekend at this fan arena. And there was the museum. There was an area to play ball hockey. And there were some Devils alumni there. Uh, Ken Danico was there. Bryce Salvador was there. Grant Marshall was there. Uh, Probably a couple others that I didn't see, but I saw those three for sure. In fact, I'll get to Dano a little bit later because him and I did a special project together while we were there. There was also virtual reality Zamboni driving, which was probably the sleeper pick of the entire thing because basically you were sitting in a makeshift Zamboni and you put on the virtual reality goggles and you clean the ice. If you have done this before, or if you did it this weekend in Jersey, like me, you probably have a totally new appreciation for anybody that drives a Zamboni for a living. Because that is not easy at all. I was, the first time I did it, I legit, I I got it out of my system, I was just banging into the boards, and then I hit the... Uh, the hockey nets and I was just being destructive as you probably would would, like Grand Theft Auto style I was basically treating it like a game like a Grand Theft Auto game and then I got it out of my system and the second time I tried it I said okay you know what 
let me see if I can actually do this properly. And needless to say, I did not. I sucked. It was awful. It was bad. And in that moment, I said, wow, this is very difficult. And I respect those men and women that drive the Zamboni and perfectly round every corner. They don't leave a single spot of uncleaned ice on that sheet. That's impressive. But anyway, if you ever have a chance, uh, if uh, hopefully that will exist somewhere, because if you've never tried the uh, Zamboni virtual reality experience, you definitely have to try it because it's a lot of fun. Uh, what else was there? The Stanley Cup was there. People were taking pictures with the cup. I actually got to take a picture uh, with Ken, which was kind of cool. as the first time I ever took a picture with a Stanley Cup winner with the Stanley Cup. And one thing I learned, which was interesting. So, so Dano and I were together. Uh, we were doing a feature about the fan arena uh, that will air in a future Devils broadcast. So him and I were going around and we were trying all the different stuff and we were having laughs and fun and we went in through the museum and we saw all the stuff there. Uh, that feature will probably be on msgnetworks.com in the near future. But one thing I learned which was very interesting to me, so Ken Danico won the Stanley Cup three times with the New Jersey Devils, 95, 2000, 2003. His name is on the cup three times. But it's not the exact same spelling each time. The 95 New Jersey Devils, the listing, his name says Ken Danico. The other two times, he opted to include his full name, Kenneth S. Danico. So his name is actually listed two different ways on the Stanley Cup. And when I brought it up to him, he said, yeah, you know, I matured in my older age. <laughs> but it's interesting to me. I'm actually going to look it up. And feel free to send me uh, some of these uh, little tidbits on Twitter, too, at Arda Ocal TV. I love hearing uh, from you guys on Twitter, whether it's about the podcast or whatever. But in this case, please tweet me if there are any uh, spelling mistakes or if anybody got added twice by mistake or any of those like random facts about the Stanley Cup and the engravings. I know that the rings are detachable. Um, I think there's about 20 or 30 years from the 20s until the 50s that are currently in the uh, a vault at the Hockey Hall of Fame. So if you want to see those engravings that used to be on the Stanley Cup, you have to go to Toronto. I think it's called the Esso Vault at the Hockey Hall of Fame in Toronto. That's where you would see those particular engravings. The other thing that caught my eye uh, that was engraved on the cup was the 2003-2004 season. I think that's the correct season. It's either that or 2004-2005. The, the, lo the lockout season where uh, nobody won the cup, uh, that's listed on the cup as no, uh, no winner. That made me a little sad because it made me remember that season and how much I wanted hockey and how much we didn't get NHL hockey and how sad that was. There's a, there's a lot of other uh, there's a lot of other things to talk about which we've definitely talked on the MSG hockey show like NHL players at the Olympics and uh, USA women's hockey and the boycott and whatever the case may be L lots of other issues to talk about in the world of hockey but I uh, definitely wanted to bring up that Ken Danico note uh, the other thing is during the feature I challenged him to a one on one show off in the ball hockey rink and let's just say there definitely was a clear winner. And I'm going to leave it at that because I want you to watch and see what happens with Mr. Devil and me one-on-one. -on -one. What else should we get to here? Oh, yes. So uh, one thing that my girlfriend and I bond over uh, is stand-up comedy. One thing that we love, we love going to stand-up comedy shows. You can typically find us, especially in the summer, you can find us at the Comedy Cellar in, in Manhattan. Uh, we search Groupon for, you know, going to Dangerfields or whatever other comedy, the comedy uh, places. We just love checking out comedy. We've been to many uh, high profile or big name shows. We love watching them on Netflix. I remember once we went to Boston to sightsee and on the way home, uh, Mohegan Sun, the casino was on the way and Jeff Dunham was randomly there. And so we stopped. We said, ah, it's on the way home. We can stop and see Jeff Dunham. And so we did. And tickets were affordable. And uh, this coming week, we're going to go to Garden of Laughs, which has a unbelievable roster. I think the best roster of comedians I've ever seen in one place. Uh, if I can think of this by memory, Leslie Jones, Chris Rock, Sebastian Maniscalco, John Oliver, Bob Saget. And Bob Saget replaces Jerry Seinfeld, who was originally announced. That is 
unreal. That's going to be a great show. And I think Tracy Morgan is there too, if I'm not mistaken. So by the time you've listened to this, obviously it'll have passed already, but uh, I'm recording this before we have gone to that. So I'll definitely mention how it was. And if you're there, come and say hi, come and find me. Uh, This past weekend, we went to see Ralphie May in Peekskill on Friday night, and uh, he was funny. I I didn't know that he'd been doing stand-up comedy for 27 years. He had some really good observations. Obviously, his delivery and his timing is spectacular, and he incorporates a lot of great callbacks into his routine. Uh, It was pretty good. I I, I thought it was really good. I I enjoy his comedy, so I, 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 I like his style. And so seeing him live was a lot of fun. Uh, if, if I had to pick one stand-up special to watch, though, it definitely is the two Dave Chappelle specials on Netflix that just dropped. Dave Chappelle has made a return to the stand-up comedy scene and basically regained his throne. He basically came back and said, Oh, did you forget that I'm the singular number one king of comedy because I think I need to remind you now that's those specials were that good and those specials weren't I think they were even a year or two old they were in the can and they were released and I think that we're going to get new material uh, throughout the year or or coming soon but it was amazing Dave Chappelle may be the funniest human being on planet earth right now he is it was just it was excellent from start to finish And one of them, I think it was the one in Los Angeles, I think has the best callback I've ever seen. You completely forget about what he talked about like 35, 40 minutes ago, and then he calls it back beautifully. And I think that was one of the greatest callbacks I've ever seen. It was just, I was laughing out loud, hysterically, and I was impressed at the same time. Like, wow, this is so good. So definitely check that one out because it was definitely worth it. If you have any uh, suggestions for stand-up specials, I think we've gone through a lot of them on Netflix. I watched the Jim Norton one recently that just came out as well. Trevor Noah has one that just came out. But if you have any suggestions on ones that uh, my girlfriend and I should check out, please uh, send them our way because, or uh, tweet them to me because at Art Ocal TV, I we love checking out stand-up specials. So let's uh, would definitely love to hear from you guys what specials you guys enjoy and and what you have found to be really funny or even ones you didn't like. T- tell me what you think because I I would love to have some dialogue about stand up comedians out there, even up and coming ones as well. Uh, whether there are some coming to the New York City area that we should check out, uh, definitely will. Uh, okay, let me get to this story before we get to our guest. Uh, I want to get to this story. This was during the last MSG Hockey Show. And by the way, the um, next episode of the MSG Hockey Show will be April 9th. It's going to be a Sunday. That uh, may or may not be the the final episode of the season. Uh, We're not quite sure yet, but right now on the books it is. So uh, that's going to be a a fun episode. It's going to be a very fun episode. Uh, We're going to enjoy it. And the season's been a lot of fun. Uh, It was a thrill uh, throughout this season working with Anson and Will. Uh, They're both... Uh, very talented dudes and a lot of fun to work with and very opinionated too, which makes the show really fun. Uh, so Anson is a little bit of a prankster as well. Uh, and he got me during the Garden of Dreams telethon. So the second time this has happened while we've been there, uh, it's a telethon. If you watch uh, MSG Networks, you're pretty familiar with this, especially during Ranger games. What happens is in one of the conference rooms at MSG Networks, they put a bunch of phones there and volunteers and on-air talent as well answer the phones and get sponsorships. Uh, People call in and buy raffle tickets for the opportunity to uh, have some really cool experiences that they normally wouldn't be able to buy, whether it's, you know, meeting the team or uh, coming into the studio and and co-hosting a segment or or whatever it is. I, I actually don't know definitively off the top of my head what the prizes were uh, this time around but that gives you a ballpark example of what kind of thing people are 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 uh, spending their hard-earned money on and and of course all the proceeds go to garden of dreams foundation uh, which does a lot of cool things in the community i know that i've worked with uh, the msg classroom where there have been students in high school that have come in and interviewed us and and done packages and 
you know, teaching them uh, the ins and outs of broadcasting and they put together their own videos and segments and that's a lot of fun for them. And, and, and some of them even catch the bug, you know, some of them even decide that maybe this is something for them. And then they maybe go to college and university and that becomes their major because they fell in love with it through Garden of Dreams. You know, that all of a sudden they're going into sports broadcasting. I would love to hear stories like that. That'd be that'd be amazing. Let me get back to the the, the rib here. Uh, so Anson and I uh, are asked to answer some phones. Of course, we're going to do this. So we do this at first intermission of that night's game. Uh, the Rangers were playing, and during the first intermission, we go upstairs into the boardroom. Uh, we'd been there before. We got briefed. Uh, we met everybody there, and we were told how to answer the phones and what we needed to say and the kind of information we needed to get from people. We legitimately, by the way, it wasn't just a publicity stunt. We were actually answering the phones and getting information. Uh, I, the, the the first time we were up there, I actually answered a phone and I got somebody to pledge uh, to, to buy a ticket, which was amazing. And, and I, you know, it was really cool. And Anson did the same thing. So we're sitting down at our phones and the phone rings. Up until this point, I'd been hamming it up with the uh, volunteers a little bit, trying to, you know, quick draw McGraw, like, like fiddle my fingers right by the receiver so I can pick it up as fast as possible. So the phone rings. And I pick up the phone as fast as I can. And I say, Garden of Dreams, may I help you? The person that's on the other side of, end of the phone says, yeah, I'd like to buy some raffle tickets. And I was like, all right, fantastic. And then I'm motioning to the camera now. There's a, there's a camera in there as well that's showing footage of us answering phones. So to the camera person, I say, okay, roll on this. This is great. Okay, uh, and, and how many tickets would you like to buy? Uh, I'd like to buy a 1,000. And my eyes widen. You want to buy a thousand tickets? I'm sorry, just so that I understand. Is that a thousand tickets or a thousand dollars? And I'm like super happy at this moment because either answer is great. And the person says, oh, a thousand, a thousand dollars actually, please. And I think it was a hundred dollars a ticket. So that was 10 tickets. And some, and a volunteer told me before we got there that the, record for most tickets sold in one phone call was 10. So here I am tying the record. And so I get ecstatic and I put the phone, I said, uh, one second, sir. And I put the phone down and I turn to everyone and I say, I just sold 10 tickets. This is amazing. And I'm hamming it up for the camera and I'm loving life right now. And I'm, you know, doing the guns and I'm just jumping up and down in super amounts of joy, sheer happiness. And then I pick up the phone again, and out of the corner of my eye, I look at Anson, who is to my left, who is huddled over and has his hand over his mouth. And then that gets me thinking. So I pick up the phone and I say, uh, what's your name, sir? And then I look over to Anson, who answers... My name is Martin Smith. So it was Anson that made the call. And I didn't, in fact, sell 10 tickets. And then the whole room laughed at me. Because Anson got me pretty good. I'm going to have to find a suitable receipt for that one, Mr. Carter. Ace. There is a receipt coming somewhere. But I will say this. The same thing worked on Steve Valaket because Steve came up a few minutes later and then I turned to Anson and said, hey, call, call Steve. And now everyone was in on it. I think they were in on it when I got had too. But Anson calls and Steve picks up the phone and he's like, hello, Garden of Dreams. Yeah, I'd like to buy $1,000 worth of tickets. Wow, $1,000, that's really imp impressive. What's your name? Uh, John Smith. Oh, John Smith, that's great. And now at this point, Steve is still not looking at Anson. So he's like, this is going on for a while. Steve realizes uh, it was a joke, was during the credit card. I think Anson was like, oh, Steve's like, what's your credit card number, sir? And Anson's like, uh, one, two, three, four, five. Six, seven, eight, and then I th and then at that point I think Steve turned over is like hey, so that's uh, that's what happened during the Garden of Dreams, which became the Garden of Laughs for a moment, and uh, 
There's there's a little callback to where we'll be this week. So anyway, uh, let's get to our guest. Uh, he is an organist in the National Hockey League. He is the organist, in fact, for the New Jersey Devils. Pete Canarosi, good friend of mine, a very talented musician, does a lot of stuff outside of hockey as well. But for anyone that ever wondered what an organist does, how he or she selects their playlists, are there any songs they're not allowed to play or that they are encouraged to play, uh, how do they pick songs per situation, power play, penalty kill, Stanley Cup victories, whatever it might be. Uh, Pete's seen and done it all. He's He's been in that position since 2001. That's, a, that's almost two decades of playing the organ for the New Jersey Devils. The one thing that I don't ask him during the interview, but I did ask him afterwards, and I'll just tell you now, is that he plays a keyboard, so he's moving the keyboard back and forth uh, and putting it into storage. So it's not a pipe organ, one of those traditional organs. Who would be using an organ like that? You know, an old school, like 60s arena or like a Count Dracula kind of organ. Would Count Dracula use an organ? Yeah, we're going to go with that. Count Dracula would use an organ. You know, that kind of organ the, with the pipes and everything. Uh, he has used that before, and there are a couple of teams. I think the Rangers actually have a hybrid. Uh, it, it's half pipe, half electronic. But mostly at this point, it's electronic equipment. There are a couple of sports teams out there that do have the pipe organ set up. But it's few and far between. Most of them are using electronic at this point. So anyhow, here is our conversation with Pete Canarosi, who is the organist for the New Jersey Devils, and we will catch you on the flip side. So here I am at the Prudential Center. Uh, it is a Sunday, uh, pretty cold day outside. The New Jersey Devils are about to play the Dallas Stars in a few hours, and I'm sitting down in the, I guess you could call it the music section. Uh, where the DJ usually is, and also uh, the famed organist. Uh, we're here sitting down with Pete Canarosi, who is the organist for the New Jersey Devils, among other things. How you doing, man? Good. I'm doing great. And you? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for uh, jumping on the podcast. Yeah. Uh, the whole purpose of this podcast is to talk to people who are involved with hockey teams who do cool jobs. And yours is one of the coolest, because you're there with the keyboard, with the organ, throughout the entire game, and you're filling people's ears and sounds with 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 delicate dulcet tones that's what you do throughout the game and it's one of the more important jobs keep people happy throughout the uh the breaks in play well put arda um yeah i i, <laughs> I could have done better but yeah. <laughs> i i have a great gig i mean i get to watch my team the new jersey devils play hockey and when they're not playing i get to play music and while i'm playing the music i get to to have the fans involved and get them pumped up and uh, in return the fans pump up the team, so it's a it's a good you know it's a good loop. We go around good. So I just want to mention to everybody, if you happen to hear any background noise, it's because we are literally in uh, I think it's section 125. So we are in the bowl right now, and uh, there might be some background noise. So if you happen to hear anything, it's because people are setting up for the game. So that's yeah, what like I'm... vacuuming. Yes, that that is probably what's <laughs> happening behind us. And and your organ is literally on right now, isn't it? It is. Can you give us a little like just maybe a little bit of a sure. Tune? You're just showing off at this point. <laughs> uh, did you grow up in Jersey? I did not. No. Where'd you grow up? I am from Chicago, Illinois. From Chicago, Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, did you grow up a hockey fan? I did. Um, my dad was a big sports fan, and he would take me to Cubs games at Wrigley. He would take me to um, uh, Blackhawk games at United Center, and um, and also uh, uh, my grandparents were White Sox fans. They lived two blocks from Comiskey Park, so we would go to... Um, See White Sox fans. I'm a big sports fan. Who were your favorite players growing up? Well, it's got to be Ernie Banks yeah. from from the Cubs and uh, and Ron Sano. The Cubs were my team, and um, then there was Brett, um, Bobby Hall, yeah. and Brett. You know those guys from the and uh, Gail Sayers from Golden the Golden Jet. Yep, all those guys. Yeah, it was great. It was nice actually. In the early '90s, the Blackhawks had a nice run. They made yeah, the Stanley Cup they Finals, did. and recently as well. The uh, last, I mean, their you know. success is. Yeah. is uh, is very good, almost dynasty levels for the yeah, Chicago Blackhawks. For sure. So, what about your love affair with music? Then, how did that begin? Uh, since I was a kid, I started playing in church when I was about eleven or twelve years old. I went to a Catholic school in the suburbs of Chicago, 
and um, the nuns found out that I could play the organ. So they would lasso me out of class and say, oh, you gotta play for mass, you gotta play for someone's wedding, you gotta play for a funeral, you know? And as a matter of fact, it became a conflict with sports because I had little league practice, and what do I do? Do I play the organ in church, or do I go to little league practice? So it was a constant conflict, but we, we worked it out. Was there one song or just one memory in particular that got you hooked, that made you fall in love with music? Yeah, uh, as a matter of fact, there was. Um, um, a neighbor on my block was an organ player, a professional musician. Oh, wow. And, and um, he had an organ in his house, and I would hear him play all the time, you know? And, and my parents were not wealthy, so I, I was afraid to ask him to give me lessons. So I went down to this guy, and I said, you know, my parents really can't afford it, but if, if I cut your lawn, would you give me organ lessons? And he said, yeah. He was really taken aback by my approach. I was 11 years old. You know, and so he came. You didn't over. ask he, for money; you asked for organ lessons. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, and uh, so awesome. I, I, he said, "You don't have to cut my grass. I'll, I'll work it out with your parents." And then my parents bought me an organ. Right after that, I don't know how, but they did. And he used to come to the house every week and give me organ lessons. Wow. Yeah. And so you, where did he play? He was, he was a professional organist. He was he? a he was a, a a club player. He played for weddings and in clubs and okay. you know parties and that kind of thing. Got you, got you. So you fell in love with the organ. Yeah. So the organ was the first instrument you fell in love yes. with. Yes. Wow. Because um, most kids would pick up like the guitar or drums. Right. You fell in love with the organ. Yeah. First. And then you know that I parlayed that into the church thing, and it was all organ after that. And I had my own band when I was a kid, and my dad was my roadie. He would bring me to all the gigs, and I played organ in all these places. The Zambonis are on the ice right oh, now. If yeah. you happen to hear any more rumblings, that's why. Yeah, uh, yeah. here's Zambonis my Zamboni are... song. Okay. How, how often do people come up here and ask for requests a lot. throughout the game? A lot? A lot, yeah. yeah. Um, especially the ones I'm not allowed to play. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. It's like, and they probably do that on purpose, yes, right? Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, they... They want to hear all the songs that are detrimental to the other team. I won't mention any songs or any names, okay, fair. but you know what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, I completely <laughs> understand what you're saying. But, so how did you, okay, let's get back to your story. So sure. how did you, how did sports come into play then? So, I mean, obviously you're the organist for the Devils now. So how did right. you begin your journey in music with sports? Uh, let's see, that happened, when did I start here? I started here in 2001. Okay, with so the Devils. With the Devils. Is this your first sports-related yes. music gig? It is, my, okay. My first one, right. And uh, I was in a... So 16 years. E right, this is my wow. 16th season, right, wow. I started, yep. And I was in a recording studio. My friends Mitch and Ira have him and I recording in Manhattan. And we were there doing a recording session. And at the time, um, the entertainment director of the Devils at Continental Arena was Glenn Adamo. And he called in to Mitch and Ira at m and Recording, and he said, uh, hey, I'm looking for an organist. And I was sitting there on the sofa, and Ira said to him on the telephone, hey, what about Pete? And he said, yeah, I'll send him over. So I went over, and they had uh, they were looking for someone Purely at the referral. Time. Yeah, just right place at the right time. Oh, wow, okay. You know, they were looking for someone at, at that time, and um, the, the guy was either leaving or I quit or whatever, and I sort of went in, and I, I you know, sussed out the situation, and I kind of figured it out, and I sort of moved into the gig and, you know, started doing it from there. So, I want to talk about uh, preparation, because yeah. uh, you play a lot of songs yeah. throughout the game. So, how does an organist prepare for a typical National, League, National Hockey League game? Well, I'm always preparing, even in the off-season, okay. and especially, you know, in the days before a game, and even like right now, I'm, I'm preparing right now, I have a script I have to go over when we finish our interview, and put in all the songs and all the things that I have to do. Um, Preparation is, you know, looking at the script and talking to the producer and, and trying to find out, is there a theme for the game? Is there anything special going on? Um, and then um, I'll always want to play new songs. I'll try to learn at least one new song every week if I can. It's a lot, but I'll try. That's, that's the goal is one song a yeah, week. Yeah, yeah, okay. because, you know, I'm, I'm not like a DJ where I can just push a button and play a song. I have to sit down. I have to transcribe, listen to the song, transcribe the song, write the music out, and practice it. So that's a whole procedure. So that's, that's a lot of my preparation, but um, I'm always listening, I'm always preparing. I turn the radio on in the car. Sometimes I'll hear a song in the car on the way here and I'll play the song because I, I just pick it up by ear. So it's multiple levels of preparation. So what, uh, how often would you say you're learning 
old school songs and how often would you say you're learning songs that are currently on the radio something that just came out for example about 50 50 yeah like half okay. the time you know i'll try to really mix it up and i have a set list uh, i could show you um it's got different genres on different set lists i've got rock i've got pop i've got you know hip-hop got old school I've got new school all, all kinds of stuff that i go through how many songs would you say you play in a typical hockey game during the game or in or while I'm here for the well, whole you time. actually you uh, don't you play for like half hour or yeah. 45 minutes before play, the game starts I play for ingress which is usually from doors open until warm-ups which is almost an hour so you're just playing consistently just, live just playing consistently Wow live. yeah and that's probably about 40 or 50 songs okay Wow yeah but you're not playing the full song like you're playing maybe what like the no I'll play the full song the full thing yeah sure during when people and, are walking in, it's an entertainment. Right, you know. and so when you're learning the song, mm -hmm. you're learning, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong here, mm -hmm. so on the organ, because you're not singing along to the song, correct. you're learning the notes of how they're singing. Correct. Right? Like, we call that the melody. The me Right, but so not only the melody of the instruments, but the melody of the voice as well. So you're playing both? Um, well, I'm, I'm playing the melody with pretty much with my right hand, which mimics what the vocalist would sing. And with my left hand, I'm playing the accompaniment. Wow, so you're doing both at the same time. Yeah, you wow. have to. There's, there's no yeah. other, you, you kind of, kind of, and if, uh, this is a keyboard, which yeah. I, I programmed to sound like an organ, but I, I'm an actual organ player, so in the, in, if I play an organ, I'll have the right hand melody, I'll have the left hand accompaniment, and my foot will play the bass pedals for the bass accompaniment. So that's three things going on. You gotta be kidding me. No. Wow. Everybody does it. Yeah, no, I get it. I'm just, for, as a non organist, I'm like, wow. Man. Yeah, it's like almost a drummer. And you gotta I got, do that for 45 minutes straight, 50 yeah, minutes straight. I, I could do it for four hours straight. Wow. Yeah. So during the game, then, uh, what are the rules in terms of when you play and when you don't play? Aha, very specific NHL rules. Okay. Um, you cannot play after the puck is dropped. So. Has that ever happened to you? Only by mistake. <laughs> <laughs> like puck is dropped and what? You just you just uh, you weren't know, paying if, attention or if, what happened? Uh, if if you know, I was I was looking at some other part of the game and I didn't see the puck drop, or I was listening to my director, he was telling me something, or I just ha had a couple notes bleed over because I wanted to finish the song, you know, um, or if I should hit the key like that by mistake, which I have done. Maybe once Have or you twice. ever done that when the opposing team is on a breakaway and you just happen to hit the keys just as he's about to take a shot? Mm, nothing like that? No, no. Never happened? No, 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 nothing like that. I'll have to go back to the footage. Yeah, to see. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So no playing after the puck is dropped. That, I, I think people uh, would have yeah. guessed that one. Any other, any other specific rules that the organist has to follow during the game? Uh, well, there are, like we were talking about before, the requests that I had for songs that I can't play. Yeah. We don't want to have the fans, you know, singing anything detrimental in, in the arena, so I won't play some of those songs. So what about, like, uh, situational? So you, do you have, like, a bank of, like, say, 10 or 12 songs that you have in mind when there's a power play or when there's a penalty kill? Um, usually, uh, those situational songs I'll have when, when there's a penalty. Like, for last night's game, for instance, you know, depending on who's got the penalty. Like the, the opposing team uh, was the Hurricanes for last night. They got a penalty. I'll play something like. Uh huh. A Beethoven. Right, Beethoven's fifth, or a Dragnet. <laughs> right, that's for the opposing team. For our guys, I'll play something a, a little, you know, we have a penalty, but a little bit more encouraging. Like there's this song called Honey, I'm Worth It. Oh, honey, I'm worth it. Okay, you got a penalty, but you're worth it. You know, I'll try to I think of that way. Or sometimes I'll play, uh, there's a Taylor Swift song called Bad Blood. We've got bad blood. Okay, that's for our penalty. So I'll try, you know, sometimes people don't get it, you know, because it's a little bit cerebral, but I'll try to get songs like that for situational things. And then, of course, we have um, Let's Go Devil songs. You know, that really gets the crowd going. Oh, you're doing the... Ah, okay, so yeah. you're doing the doon, 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 uh, doon, doon, doon split, on the keyboard. I split my keyboard with right hand for Let's Go Devils and... Wait, wait, I want to try that. Hold on. I yeah, try come that. on. I want to... Uh, let's switch seats for just a second. You got Let it. me go around this okay. way, actually. Yep, you got it. So come I'm on. moving towards the organ All right, right now, organ actually. organ lesson for Arda. All right, here we go. Organ lesson one. This I is going to be this... awful, I can tell. <laughs> this is going to be ridiculous. All right, I like it. 
I just right, did this last here. week for Junior Organist Day. I taught them how to play. This. I'm going to be way worse than the Junior <laughs> Organist, Pete. I can guarantee you. Uh, okay. okay. So now pl play these two notes. Okay. All right. That's the Let's Go Devils. Here, let me put that over there. Okay. And then down at the very bottom. There you oh, go. Wait, I got to press more though. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm getting the hang of this. <laughs> All right. I mean, I, I can work on my timing. Hold on. This is something I've always wanted to try. Hold on. Go ahead. <laughs> got it. Got it. I got it. And that just went throughout the entire arena. I love it. That's the knuckle song. And thus ends my, uh, my I retire now as an uh, organist right. for I, the New Jersey Devils. Lesson number one in the book. <laughs> I've done it. Uh, what else? So, and, and obviously, so here you you work with DJ. DJ Yoshi is the guy Correct. you work with Correct. Uh, here. So how do you guys coordinate when to play, what to play? Is there a communication between you two? Yes, there's a, a lot of communication. We both wear headsets and we communicate with Joe Cucci and Ben Broder. Um, who they're in know. the events team, yeah. They're in the events team and they work for Master Control. Yeah. And during the game... Ben leads the team. He's the... Uh, He's the guy. Right. And, the dude. And, and Joe is the director. He directs yeah. everyone. So the two of them are running the show. Um, and they'll, they'll let us know. Like, he'll, he'll tell me if there's a penalty coming up. He'll say, okay, go, Pete. And he doesn't even have to tell me what to play. I'll know what to play. So uh, let's talk about the community. I mean, the, the organists around the league, is that a tight-knit community? Do you know a lot yes, of them? Yes, I do, actually. Um, I know Paul from the Islanders. I know Ray from the Rangers. I know um, Ron from the Bruins. I know Frank from the Blackhawks. I know Dieter from the Kings. And we all talk all the time. We yeah. have a we have a group on on Facebook, as a matter of fact. Oh, really? We talk about. Is it the a closed we group? Do. You guys like uh, yeah, discuss? Yeah, it's like yeah? a network. Okay. Yeah, that's it's pretty cool. cool. Yeah. So, what would you guys discuss? Um, you know, the league rules and what songs we play, and um, what we do, wh what kind of organ uh, keyboards that we use, what kind of organ instruments we have, that kind of thing. So you have a portable keyboard, and actually you move that back and forth every game. I do. Okay. So yes. tell me that. Tell me the setup process for you. Uh, well, I store it up in uh, P1 level near the control room. Okay. So I'll come in every day and I keep it put away in a case, but this whole rolling stage is all preset. So I take the keyboard out of the case, put it on here, plug it in, and I wheel it down the hallway, as you've seen me many times. Yeah. Jump in the elevator, come down to UC level, and wheel it into 125, and plug in, and we're ready to go. Do, uh, so you're set up, you play during the game. What about uh, the players? Do they ever come to you and say, hey, I really like this song? Or uh, have they ever said, "We, I liked when you played this? Because some players enjoy certain tracks. I know that they talk to the DJ sometimes yeah. and say, hey, can you play this during the warm-up or whatever it is? Right. I I've, I've hadn't been had too much interaction with the players. I'm okay. sort of on, you know, they're down on that side. I'm sort of up here, you know, so I don't really have too much interaction. But occasionally it'll get passed through, you know, um, the control room and the entertainment folks to say, you know, can you do this or can you do that? Got you. So uh, maybe one day the players will join the Facebook group and yeah. say, hey, guys, we really like yeah. when you play uh, Money, Money or whatever yeah. it is. But I do get a lot of feedback from, from the fans. Yeah. The fans really like or, they? the organ music. Well, you're pretty accessible. Right, right now, you're, we're in Section 125, like I said, but all that's really separating you from a section of fans is a velvet rope. So Co people can come up to the rope yeah. and basically talk to you. Yeah. And so you, you interact with fans throughout I the game. I do all the time. Yeah. I take pictures with them. I post with them. A lot of them want to come and take a picture with them standing next to the organ and they they all say they really like the, the organ music at the games it makes them feel like it's real old-time hockey that's really cool yeah so what do you do in the offseason um, I do a lot of things um, I work at William Patterson University I, I teach kids how to record music into Pro Tools and uh, I work as a solo pianist doing various gigs in, uh, in the metropolitan area um, I'm the pianist and conductor for um, a Motown artist named Valerie Simpson who's from New York wow. of Ashford and Simpson and, cool. um, you know, I do a lot of different gigs. So you're keeping active in the music community on top of playing sure. here with the Devils. Sure. So you have been here since 2001, you said. Uh, so you've seen uh, a Stanley or two and I've you've had seen, some memories. Yes. Uh, so tell me, as the organist from your bird's eye view, uh, what have been some of your favorite memories playing music for the New Jersey Devils? June 7th, 2003, Game 7, Anaheim Ducks and Devils, Stanley Cup Final. The score was three to nothing going into the third period. And I'm telling you, the electricity was, was you, could, you could feel it. And the floor and the walls, it was there because we knew we were going to win the cup. It was incredible. So do you remember any of the songs you played during that period? Oh, gosh. 
Or, or do you remember the first song you played after the Devils won the Stanley Cup? Uh, I didn't play. The DJ played it. Okay. It was an Eminem song. Okay. It was an Eminem song? Yeah, eight, from 8 Mile. The uh, Lose Yourself? Lose Yourself. Is, was Lose Yourself was the first song that was played? Uh, I, In the see. moment, you never let it go. That one? I think so. That's an interesting so, choice. Yeah, something from case. something from it was something okay. from Eminem, and then they played some very orchestral music as well. Okay. There was a, a bunch of songs going on. It wasn't just that one. So song. you didn't play uh, after the win anywhere, um, even as the fans were leaving. Nothing. Uh, I probably played some exit music. Maybe. Did you yeah. play the Imperial March when Gary Bettman came on the ice? <laughs> no, I'm no, kidding. I did not. <laughs> just kidding, Gary. Just kidding. Uh, so well, I could have. <laughs> do you? Uh, do you treat that game differently than any other game, like in terms of your preparations, which songs you have? Because, like you said, you learn one song a week, but did that go up during the playoffs? Did you try to switch it up, or did you keep it familiar for the fans? Um, no, I wanted to keep it familiar. And if there, if there were any requests from from a production team, I would learn a song for that. So you'd learn a song yeah. if, if that was the case. Uh, what other memories? Anything uh, non-Stanley Cup related? Any like interesting things that have uh, happened yeah, to when, you? Yeah, when, when I met Marty Brodeur who's my favorite devil of all time. And he actually gave me a selfie, which was probably one of the coolest selfies I ever got. Oh, really? Yeah, so what a great guy. This was after he, he retired, and he was here with the Blues, you know, um, in, his, in his job there. And he was up on the P1 level getting a coffee. And I saw him, I, you know, I introduced myself. And like what, he, at the concession stand? Yeah. Uh, no, can up you on P1. Oh, I was going to say, I was like, can you imagine if uh, <laughs> Martin Broder is at the concession stand at a Devils game getting a coffee? Sure, now everyone's going to leave him alone. Yeah, right. I'm one of the greatest devil ever. Yeah. <laughs> Just getting a coffee. Yeah, that was, that was a, a great moment for me. That's awesome. That's cool. Uh, this has been fun, Pete. I appreciate it. I feel like we're going to get interrupted yet again. Can I, uh, can I make one request before we go? I'll, I'll try. Okay. Sure. Do you know any Metallica? I do. Can you play some Metallica? I, I on can. On the way out. Okay, oh, here, we, awesome. here we go. Just give me a second to set up. Yeah, that sounds like Lars. Oh yeah. We're up to never, never land. That's awesome. I love it. And there you go, you got the melody going. That's awesome. I can't believe you did that from memory. When was the last time you even played that? I play it every now and then. That's awesome. You know, but I, I, you know, I love it. I love it. Please put that in the rotation. You got. You can. I'll play it for you tonight. Ah, yes. All right. I'll play it in it during ingress. That's for you. awesome. Pete, thanks for your time. My pleasure. So there you have it, a very fun conversation with Pete Canarosi, organist for the New Jersey Devils. I wish it was a little bit longer, but unfortunately, he was getting ready for the game. So we'll give him a pass. Uh, maybe it's my poor booking and my poor timing, but that was the only time that uh, him and I could get together to record the podcast. So blame it on me, guys. Blame it on me. Uh, anyway, you can check out this podcast every single Wednesday on iTunes and MSGNetworks.com. Please subscribe on iTunes and leave a comment. Oh, and give us a five-star rating. It'll help people find this podcast, and we really w would appreciate that. As well, Art as Words on a Blog drops every Monday on msgnetworks.com. Ice and Madness will conclude this week. We will have determined the greatest retro ice hockey video game of all time. Next week, we'll have a different guest on the A-Pod. And the next edition of the MSG Hockey Show is April 9th. That is a Sunday. And actually, the day before that, on Saturday, April 8th, will be the final home game for the New Jersey Devils, and I will be on that telecast with Deb Placey and John McClain. And I look forward to that uh, because we have a cool little social media experiment planned for that. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Thank you very much for checking out the A-Pod. Until next week, I'm Arda. Thanks for listening. 
Catch you next week.